So hello everyone, hello everyone, I hope that all of you are able to hear me and uh, welcome to another microscopy live stream today. Let's uh, quickly check uh, if uh, I'm actually able to see myself. So I'm going, ah yes, here I am. I'm just uh, always uh, checking myself also in the web browser, okay. So yeah, hi, uh, hello again. Um, See, uh, nice to see you again. Welcome to another live stream. Um, today I would like uh, to uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, a, uh, yeah, some alternative lighting techniques uh, like uh, for example using uh, oblique illumination and dark field and, and so on. Um, yeah, I would like to simply show you a couple of things that you can do with that and it's like every time at the beginning I would like uh, to go through the chat on the side to say to have a look from where you are all over the world and aloha from Honolulu, um, hello from Lebanon I see here from Serbia, from Spain, uh, welcome, uh, welcome all across the world. Um, and uh, from, from Kashmir, okay, um, also from Spain again, from the UK, from Scotland, <laughs> I love this, okay, uh, yes, and uh, from Southern California, all over the world, uh, microscopy is loved, <laughs> and nature, Scotland, nature observation, um, that's a, a thing that we all love to do together, Washington DC, Great, yeah. Netherlands, Maine from the United States. Uh, Saarland is in Germany, Mexico. <laughs> okay, so hi, hello everyone. Uh, welcome from Austria in Europe. And uh, yeah, um, today I'm going to do the following. I would like to um, yeah, show you um, how to do a little bit of um, simple uh, upgrade. Um, that's a dark field patch stop over here. Yeah, ho hello from Australia, I see here. From Washington State, USA, okay. Yeah, um, so what I would like to do is the following. Um, ma many of you probably already know about this, but uh, maybe some of you, uh, it's, it's, it's new. Um, it's like this, uh, that it is possible with very simple additions like uh, those so-called dark field or uh, patch stop, it, it's possible to improve or to change uh, the image under the microscope in such a way that it looks a little bit three-dimensional, okay? So it casts shadows. The image does not quite look as flat anymore. And I would like to show this to you. And also I would like to show this how this relates to oblique illumination. Um, and uh, also I would like to play around a little bit with uh, those uh, blue filters um, as well, because this uh, allows you to give uh, the image a slightly bluish background. So um, I would like to simply uh, 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 try this using a, a water sample. Just wanted to show you the original water sample. The original water sample I've taken some plants uh, from an aquarium. Okay, um, but the problem with um, this is is that uh, because they're fish, of, of course, in an aquarium, sometimes the concentration of protozoa and other interesting microorganisms is relatively low because as soon as they start growing um, on the plants, the fish start eating them away. Um, and so if you want to look at uh, some, some protozoa under the microscope, what you have to do is you have to put some of the plant material <clears throat> into a little jar like this and then add a little bit of food. Now as a food, I'm using a crushed cereal grain uh, or cornflake or, or something starchy, not too much. And you add it to the water and then you let it stand for about five days. Now this cereal grain, um, yeah, or oats, um, oats for example, it's also crushed cereal, um, it will basically then cause the growth of bacteria and the bacteria are then again food for the protozoa that you have in there and the protozoa will start to multiply. Okay, so that is a uh, method of enriching and this uh, way you can receive quite a high concentration of, of um, the water microorganisms, uh, far higher than in the original um, water sample that I've got over here. Okay, so um, I'll be looking at uh, those uh, under the microscope um, and I'm going to show you how this looks under so-called DIC, that's differential interference contrast. It's again a pretty long word, which gives you a slightly three-dimensional appearance and then also under oblique illumination using a variety of these filters here. Okay, um, for those of you who have uh, been joining already in the past, um, I like to always interrupt my uh, live stream uh, a little bit uh, every now and then to uh, yeah, look at the comments a little bit. Feel free to ask questions. Um, some of the questions might be a little bit off topic, uh, but I will try to answer them anyway as long as they are microscopy related. Okay, so I'm going to yeah, Washington State, USA. Yeah. Um, my favorite filter is the 50% uh, cutaway with uh, 
no center divider. Ah, yes, uh, this a 50% cutaway would be probably a filter um, where basically, uh, yeah, it's cut across here, I suppose. Okay. Hello from South, South Africa. You're why I now own two microscopes. Oh, beautiful. One is an Omex one and the amp scope with uh, semi apochromatic objectives. Uh, I love it if uh, people um, can be, yeah, start to love the hobby because of the videos. Can you also use milk if you can? Yes, it is possible to uh, make a so-called a milk culture. So instead of adding a crushed uh, wheat grain or oats or something, you can also add a small amount. That's really important. A very small amount of milk, just that it uh, turns a little bit cloudy. Um, and then after a few days, the cloudiness of the milk will disappear because all of the fat droplets in the uh, water have been eaten up by the protozoa. But it's really important, especially with milk, you have to be careful. Um, if you add too much milk, then the bacteria are going to grow faster than the protozoa can grow. And the bacteria will take away a lot of oxygen and then the protozoa can also not grow. So you, if you're overfeeding, it's a real problem. So you can make a milk culture, add a very small amount of milk, just that it turns a little bit cloudy um, and uh, then you have to wait a few days until the cloudiness disappears and this means that the protozoa have eaten up uh, the milk okay um, yeah um, why am I why am I not making a, a video on the paper fuge I'm waiting from last Monday okay uh, because uh, I'm still uh, experimenting around with a paper fuge but if you want to try uh, it's a paper centrifuge if you want to try this out yourself then I recommend do not make it out of paper, but take a CD-ROM, put two different two holes in it and then put some strings through it. And then you can also use it with a CD-ROM. Okay, I will promise that I will try doing that. But uh, things like this do need a little bit of preparation because in some cases I have to try it out myself first um, to optimize this. Okay, um, could you 3D print these little things? These little things here are, as a matter of fact, 3D printed. Um, so I basically uh, designed this um, um, online. There is an, a free uh, web uh, yeah, designer called Tinkercad and then I printed it. Use, but uh, the problem that I found is, is that uh, it's kind of, uh, if you want to adjust the darkness of the color, you can adjust the thickness, but sometimes it's a little bit too thin and it kind of got a little bit difficult to kind of remove it from the, from the 3D printer, okay? Um, so that's basically, um, yeah, but I'll, I'm going to show this how this works here. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, doing for cheap, one for measuring lenses, yes. Hello from Israel, hello. Uh, yes, the video about identification books comes out soon and if it will be some books in English. Yeah, um, what I have to tell you is, is that uh, I don't know so many identification books in English um, because... Uh, yeah, I would actually say that uh, it, it's difficult to, yeah, I'd have to have a further look. There are some identification books, but not, not all of the books contain all of the specimens. Okay. Hello from Poland. So let's uh, talk a little bit theory first here. Um, what I have over here is a, is a, a condenser. I simply uh, detached it now from another microscope uh, because it's easier for me then to, to show you. Okay, um, so what we have is the following. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the, uh, the condenser aperture diaphragm. You see how it's able to open and close. And this diaphragm, what it does is it, it changes the, I don't know how I'm going to show this, the width or the angle of, of the light cone that emerges here. Okay, yeah, so that is, uh, it changes the angle. Um, and what you have here is, uh, this is from an older Olympus microscope. You have a filter holder, and this is a so-called a pop-on filter holder. And you see that uh, it's blue and uh, there is some blue glass in here. And the reason why it's blue is, is because um, the microscopes at that time used a lot of halogen light bulbs or tungsten light bulbs. So there was a lot of red light and a lot of infrared light. And this uh, gave the image a slightly a reddish orange color. And this blue filter uh, removed the red parts of the spectrum, making the image a little bit more neutral in, in color or white or blue, I wouldn't even say bluish in color, but simply not as red anymore. And so even though it looks kind of blue here, the image that you got was not blue, but actually was actually in a more neutral white. Um, and this uh, push on um, yeah, blue filter over here um, also serves as a filter holder. And this here is uh, also from the company Olympus, a, cur a commercial metal um, dark field patch stop, which happens to fit in here, okay? 
and uh, you put it in here. This is a so-called a dark field filter, and then you basically push it on here. And then um, under the microscope, what will happen is, is that uh, the background will become dark and the light which is able to pass on from the side will illuminate the specimen so it's a little bit like if you have an object i don't know any object let, let me just use this i don't know these scissors here okay if this is the specimen um the background is, is black but the light will strike the object from the side and it will be reflected into the objective and so it is uh, the object appears white um, on a dark background Okay, so this is the, the, the philosophy or the principle of dark field uh, microscopy. I'm going to show you later on. I'm going to show this to you also um, under the microscope, of course. First, a little bit the theory. So, however, there is now the possibility also for so-called oblique illumination. And in case of oblique illumination, the light will strike the object from one side only. So what I could do is, is I could kind of block out half of uh, the filter over here so that to only make light appear from one side. And when this happens, then it looks like that the light will strike the object from one side. This will be then the side that's a little bit brighter and the other side of the object will be a little bit darker. And uh, because of that, you get a little bit the appearance of a kind of a, a, as if the object is standing out a little bit and it will give it a slightly three-dimensional appearance. The important thing is, is it's not really stereoscopic. It's not really three-dimensional because both eyes see the same thing. But by looking at it, um, it because the light appears to shine from the side and it does shine from the side, um, you, you get a slightly, slight, slightly better sense of depth. And this kind of makes some, some objects a little bit more interesting to look at, okay? So I'm going to go back to the comments again, okay? Yeah, um, hello from Brazil, yes, okay. White or Teleview, okay. Uh, well, this is, I don't know if you're referring to this here. This is not really related to wide view or Teleview. The, yeah, it's more related to the numerical aperture, okay? How do you detach this condenser from the microscope? Do you have to calibrate the condenser again after placing it back? Well, this one over here was actually quite easy to detach. There was a screw here which was able to tighten it and then it simply went uh, off and you could put it back on. Some microscopes um, have two additional centering screws on the left and right. They're kind of in diagonal and this way it can also center the microscope. Uh, some microscopes don't allow you to do that and you have to kind of loosen the screws and then center it and then tighten it. Generally, um, there is should not be a lot of need to always recenter it. Once it's centered, it should stay centered. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I have a Nikon 0.9 numerical aperture flip condenser. I found out that if you put the filter between the flip lens and the main lens, it gives better results. Okay. Yes. Can brain-eating amoeba pres be present in pond or water? Um, in pond water, all sorts of amoeba can be present. Um, but the amoeba that you are referring to, which has been in the media a few years ago, um, yeah, the pond, I mean, there are all sorts of pathogens all, all over the place. It's also a question of actually whether you're actually getting this contaminated water into your system and if the concentration is high enough. So it depends on a variety of other factors as well, okay? Um, so, hey, I have had a $230 Amscope microscope for almost three years. I have been planning to upgrade it for a while. Yep. What can you think about the Olympus Manox TAH2? I don't know that. I mean, I think I've seen a picture of this, um, but uh, I mean, uh, generally, uh, um, whether a microscope is good or not for you depends on a variety of factors. I mean, but Olympus, of course, is a good company name, a good co brand. But whether the actual microscope is going to be satisfactory for you or not depends on what you want to do with it. And of course, on personal preference. Yeah? I've managed to build an impro improvised polarizing filter for a broken LED TV screen. Yes, if you want to do a polarizing, uh, if you don't want... Uh, to use a broken LED TV screen, you can also buy polarizing film on Amazon. It does not cost so much, but those uh, filters can be bought, okay? Okay, filters make it easier to see spore walls and openings from what I found. I have a problem with a four times objective. You've got to be a little more specific what the problem is here. And I only have a cheap microscope. It has a lead with a small plastic looking condenser. Can it still be done with the cheap scopes? That's an interesting question, okay? Uh, Rob asks the following. Um, the thing is the following. Your uh, microscope must have a condenser like this. This is really important. There are some cheap microscopes out there, introductory microscopes. 
and they don't have this condenser um, and then it is unfortunately not possible I've tried it out okay unfortunately it's not going to work the reason is is because the angle that the light actually strikes the specimen is pretty important and the condenser is responsible for adjusting this okay so unfortunately the uh, microscopes without a condenser um, just some of the cheaper microscopes the introductory microscopes they have some kind of a wheel that you can turn uh, with different openings but that's not a full condenser yeah so unfortunately that's not going to work yeah looks like a yeah <laughs> okay i found a vanic for 350 pounds sounds intriguing yep um honestly um whether um it's uh, which microscope is good or bad for you is something that you have to uh yeah it's a to a certain extent an individual decision as well okay ah yeah just what i want to clarify here is is the following this is a push on um uh, uh, filter holder however the majority of microscopes these days actually do have an advantage and this is the reason why I've now actually set up a different microscope today here uh, the majority of, of the microscopes with a condenser have a so-called a swing out okay filter holder yeah so there is it's, it's connected on one place with a screw and then you can basically rotate it out and then you can rotate it back in and that has a really big advantage okay and the reason is because it allows you to adjust the position more precisely okay um, with uh, this push on filter um, holders what you have to do is is actually because you cannot change the position of the filter you'd have to make yourself a series of different filters and see then which one works best for you okay with different sizes of cutouts and so on uh, because you cannot change the position anymore or what you can try to do is, is if you have a push on filter um, a holder microscope is that you simply hold it in there and then experiment it around a little bit and you, you manually move the filter uh, holder around to see what effect it has okay um, another thing I want to say before I'm actually going into the practical part is uh, you might also want to try to cover the lamp directly um, however this does not work quite as well okay um, to kind of block part of the lamp but you can try it out okay I have some problems with my 4D objective that makes it blurry. Any idea of what can be happening? It's a, uh, okay. Um, blurry objectives can be because it's dirty. Maybe you dumped it into immersion oil. Take it out from the microscope. Look at it from behind. Okay. And then um, against a bright wall or a lamp. And then you're able to actually see whether there is actually dirt on the lens. But you have to take it out, screw it out from the microscope and look through it from behind okay then you can determine whether it's dirty or it could be that actually I don't know what your expectations are maybe the image is a little bit blurry because uh, at higher magnifications they look a little bit blurrier um, and then uh, maybe um, it's simply because of that okay but most likely if it's really blurry it could be indeed uh, that it's dirty okay um, okay must have found someone with a warehouse I'm sure you'll find something I, uh, the Vanox is an excellent microscope. It was the top of the Olympus range in light. Okay, in the 70s. Hello, I just found out about your live stream last week and happy to catch it today. Also happy that you found it. Um, and uh, yeah, I will do weekly live streams, but probably not next week. Next week is, is, is Christmas Eve um, on the 24th. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually have to tell you I'm eating dinner in the evening <laughs> with my family. So... So I'll be preparing now a little water sample here that we can actually put under the microscope finally. And I would like to show you this uh, then under the microscope here. Okay. Um, so what you want to do is the following. Um, I want to, the, the wheat grain that I added last week um, is already gone. Yeah, there might be some, yeah. But look at this, uh, this slimy stuff here. Okay. So usually there is now a lot of stuff here. Uh, growing on here and what I like to do is I like to dip, simply dip it um, on the yeah on the microscope slide uh, hoping that I don't know look at this hoping that some of the cells or whatever is on here will actually uh, be flushed out and then I'm going to put a cover glass on top actually I wanted to put a small cover glass like this on here but there might be a little bit too much water now. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of those big cover glasses that I have. Um, yeah. Look at this here, these are pretty big, but in, they, they, they have, uh, this is a little bit frustrating um, that essentially, yeah, many of them are not quite clean. 
So uh, there is this, I don't know, from the manufacturing, this, this, I don't know, some, some kind of grease or slime or uh, not slime, but some kind of, I don't know. It, it's simply not quite clear. Okay. And so I'm using this uh, microfiber cloth that's also used for, for cleaning. Um, this like, like almost like this grease on it, you know? Um, yeah. So it's for cleaning um, uh, glasses. And I found this microfiber cloth to be quite useful because uh, you can, of course, also use tissue paper, but tissue paper still produces, it produces fibers, okay? And uh, sometimes they're those fibers, then who cares about the fibers? I mean, not a big problem. And then um, I put it on here. And uh, yeah, let's, let's see um, if it actually yeah, works or not. And I'm going to first uh, put it uh, on my regular microscope, uh, the one that I always use. Um, and uh, let's simply, uh, that's basically also for differential into DIC and bright field. We're going to try this a little bit. Okay. So let's, um, you're not able to see the stage now because I actually moved the camera to the other microscope. Let's move put this away. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. The, there, there is something going on here. Okay, that's another ten times objective. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to go up a little bit here, and then I'm going to show you um, how this actually then looks like on the bright field as well. Okay, a whole bunch of ciliates. I mean, I've also seen some slightly larger paramecia, occasional vorticella. Um, the thing is, is you need a, a high concentration of microorganisms, otherwise it's difficult to always chase them around and you have to move, oh, where's the next one? And it's very irritating. Um, but if you have a high, reasonably high concentration, uh, like we've got here, then there are usually always a few of them that are, that are visible. Okay. So um, that's now basically, and uh, I'm a little bit irritated by the fact that, for a second, it's not, Okay, um, so um, I'm going to now show you, this is now in bright field, regular bright field, and the image does look a little bit flat. I'm just gonna go up with to 40X so that you see this a little bit better. Okay, so uh, this is basically how you would normally see it. Okay, and it's fine, uh, yeah. Um, but uh, if you look carefully, then all of those cells, they kind of uh, look a little bit flat in the sense that uh, the light is not, does not seem to be striking the cells from one side. Okay, yeah. so and then I'm going to, so that's not differential, I'm going to switch on now differential interference contrast, DIC it's called, okay, um, and then when you put that in, and when I change the filter around a little bit, ignore the color for right now, okay, just ignore the color, I can change because of the polarization, but you can actually see that um, if you look at a cell, that the cells start to look a little bit like they stand out, okay? That there is a little bit like um, light striking uh, the cells uh, from one side. It gives it a little bit more of a sense of depth. I just ch change this, find the best solution here, just a second. Yeah. Okay. Let's open this a little bit more. And if you look carefully and look at the border, then you're going to see that the one side of the cell um, is, uh, yeah, has, is a little bit more shadowy, the edge and the other side is a little bit brighter, okay? Um, so this basically me it means that uh, yeah, you get a, a, a strong sense of depth here and as if the cells are standing out and in comparison, I'm going to now go back to the, yeah, to the, to the other one, it looks more flat, okay? So that is a, a so-called DIC, okay? Um, and uh, this is, uh, yeah, a nice technique to use. Maybe we can see it a little bit better if we go up uh, yet one further, okay? And this is now 60 times. It's, and that's, of course, now a little bit more difficult to kind of uh, chase them around, yeah? Yeah, but uh, the actual cells, they appear to be standing out a little bit now, okay? I just see that, the, yeah? It's a little too dark now. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the idea. I just see that uh, they also don't quite move quite as smoothly because I think that the frame rate is a little bit, uh, should adjust it a little bit more. Okay, 
Um, so, uh, just some of the questions now. How, move, how do these little things move? Uh, these are so-called ciliates. So what they have is they have microscopic hair that move on the surface. And those here, they move, and this way they are able to move, um, move along, okay? Um, so, um, sometimes in some of the cells, you're actually able to see those here move, but they move very quickly, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, without a brain, they move without a brain, yes, <laughs> they are able to sense the direction of certain chemicals, for example, oxygen, however, okay, because they have certain, um, yeah, chemical receptors in the cell membrane, which is able to detect that, yeah, um, yeah. You, okay. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yep, the cell walls get different. Okay, all of this DIC kind of looks like bright field. It is, DIC is a variation of bright field microscopy. Okay, it is, yeah. Um, it is uh, where the, the light uh, is phase shifted. Yeah? Some DSC adapters have two settings, either bicolor or black and white with a 3D effect. Generally, you can't have both effects at the same time. In my case, what I can do is I can kind of turn uh, this wheel here at the top and this kind of shifts the prism so I'm able to you know, yeah adjust this a little bit here okay so this is basically um, one way of, of, of getting this uh, 3D, 3d appearance um, however it requires you to have a DIC microscope which um, yeah most people obviously don't have and most companies do not make Okay, so that is a little bit of um, um, a thing, and that's the reason why we've uh, um, decided to talk about those little filter things here, because uh, they can achieve a similar effect, okay? So, um, yeah, I did once uh, with a combination of grains and milk and put some moss for, for oxygen in a bit of bigger container, and the results were amazing. There were hundreds of just in one drop. Yes, yeah, if you enrich it, yeah, then there's uh, lots of cells. Uh, I've cleaned my objective from inside and outside and now it's clear as crystal. Okay. Can I buy a proper condenser to fit my scope? This depends on your microscope. If you have an introductory microscope, a small one, then there will not be a condenser. It's uh, most likely. So um, upgrading microscopes is a difficult thing unless you are really in the high-end microscope range. Okay. Um, so, and then chances are pretty good that a condenser is going to cost way more than the whole microscope itself. Yeah? So, um, is there something at home that can I put into the water to make it more viscous to slow the movement? That is a good one. Um, it is like this. It, to uh, kind of slow the movement, there are several possibilities. I might even make a video of this. Uh, you can go and buy a commercial product. It's called Proto Slow, S-L-O, Proto slow but it's called s so the slow is not with a w at the end but slo it's a commercial product uh, which uh, makes you can add to the water sample which uh, causes it to slow down or what another thing that you do is, is you simply use very little water and this way you're kind of squeezing the cells between cover glass and, and, and microscope slide and this way you're um, also limiting the movement or you simply go um, and you go uh, with a very high concentration so that there will be all, always a few cells or if you wait long enough, what's going to happen is, is that more and more cells will start to accumulate um, on the sides where there is more oxygen. I think it's a little bit too early now still, okay? But um, actually the cells, uh, the ciliates and so on, they will actually move to the side and uh, gather there where there is more oxygen, okay? So, um, but I think I, I, everyone's already waiting a little bit. We're going to start playing around with the filters, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, what's the life expectancy of these creatures? Uh, do, uh, do they reproduce? Yes, all living things reproduce. What is the life expectancy? You'll be surprised. Theoretically, infinite. Because when a cell has reached a certain size, it will divide and then there are two. So they do not have a limited life expectancy like, for example, we humans have. Okay? Um, then uh, because uh, as soon as they have a certain size, uh, then they divide. So this concept of individuality as like we humans have does not apply here. Some philosophers say, well, actually it's similar in human beings as well uh, because we continue also to live in the next generation, in our children. So we're also passing on life from generation to generation. I know it's a little bit more of a philosophical concept, okay? But they do not have a built-in uh, life expectancy where they die of old age, yeah? Okay, um, yeah, okay, there is a, even a, a proposal for a name uh, of what it could be, 
Okay, you might be able to insert a quarter wave plate to switch DSC from bicolor to black and white 3D effect. That's interesting. I will, yeah, I'll find uh, find out if uh, something like this is possible. So, but you know what? Finally, let's switch over. Okay. So I'm going to now put. Uh, um, I'm going to show you. This is now the second microscope that I have. This is um, the Swift um, Stellar One. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just going to show you here. Also here at the top. Yeah. I mean, I made I made a review of this microscope also before. It's a uh, how much was it? Um, I don't know. Around, uh, it can be bought for 400 to 600 dollars or dollars or euros and here at the bottom you have this uh, swing out filter holder now these microscopes also come with a blue filter um, which i have to say i don't know what the point is because it's a, an led microscope so you do not need to um, adjust the color but what i'm going to do is, is i'm going to not only put this in here first so i'm going to take uh, the, the slide okay and i'm just going to put it into the swift microscope now and uh, why, why don't I see anything? Okay, because it's out of focus. Okay, maybe I have to close the condenser a little bit. Always close the condenser at the beginning. Where is the condenser? Diaphragm, I lost it. Here it is. Okay, a little bit more light. A little bit out of focus. Okay, so that's basically uh, yeah, a regular bright field just like before. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, maybe that's actually nicer. Okay, so I'm um, uh, using a, a ten times so ten times objective, and now let's try the following. Um, now let's try to add a little um, dark field filter. I'm going to show this to you first on the desk first. Okay, uh, back to the desk view. So I've uh, cut out uh, some plastic, a plastic sheet from some plastic packaging material vegetables i think tomatoes also were in this plastic container it's a very soft uh, plastic and i put some electrical tape here um, on the center to block out the center part so essentially i made the same thing as over here yeah but not everyone has a 3d printer so you can just make it yourself i'm going to put this now under the microscope and uh, we're going to see how this looks like okay so um so i'm going to put this in here you can actually see this here on the bottom what i'm doing here in the corner I hope, hope it's able to stay in. Up, fell out. Okay. I didn't quite get the size correctly, I guess. Okay. And then I'm going to move this in now. And I want you to watch a little bit what happens now. But I have to, let's find a few cells. Where are they? They're escaping away. Uh, here's, here's, here's one. Okay. And I want to see more. Ah, see, they're already moving towards the side a little bit where the oxygen is. So, and look what happens when I actually push it in. That's now the, the side, the border. Okay. And when I continue... Where is it? Ah, this was... This is dark field already. Okay, look. And when I continue doing this, look, halfway. Look what happens when I move it in halfway. Look how the objects look like. They all start to appear 3D. Look, the top part of the cells is brighter than the bottom part. They appear to stand out a little bit. And this is known as oblique illumination. Okay? So you get a DIC similar effect by moving the, the filter halfway. And if you move it in completely, like this, and you need to go up with the light, you have something called dark field. Yeah? And that's what I talked about before. The, the specimen is bright on a dark background. Okay, um, and uh, for some specimen it really looks nice. Yeah, um, and dark field uh, has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is it looks nice. Huh? The disadvantage is it's very, very dust sensitive. So you see small particles uh, floating around much better. Even dirt and dust can be seen much better. But if this is a little too intensive for you, then you just move it out again a little bit. Okay. So they have the light striking from one side, and then again, you see uh, that the objects start to stand out a little bit. Look at those, uh, ah, I've got an arrow here. Look at, look at the arrow. Why not, why not use the arrow? Look at some, I don't know what these are, some kind of, I don't know, grains, of uh, debris. And you see that the top side is bright, and the bottom side is dark. So the light seems to be striking the objects from the top side, and this gives it a slightly three-dimensional appearance, like it's standing out. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so what's some, what are some other, um, yeah? So I'm, I'm gonna scroll up here now a little bit. Um, so, good quantum nem nematodes are difficult to observe. Yeah, because uh, their nematodes are moving uh, like crazy. Okay, they're really, yeah. What camera are you currently using on the microscope? Well, the camera that I'm using over here, it, uh, the, the one where you're seeing it right now, is a five megapixel um, a camera. I've got the box somewhere, where's the box? That's the camera that I'm using right now. Yeah, it's a good camera, okay? It's, it's the USB 2.0 version. Um, so for this reason, it's probably not suited very well for making videos because the transmission speed is, is, is not quite as, as, as high. Yeah? Um, but, uh, as you see, but it works well, as you can see. Yeah? But where are the cells again? You see they're kind of moving away because um, maybe, maybe they're, yeah, here. They're moving to the side now because here we are already pretty much at the edge of the cover glass because they're moving towards oxygen. Okay, so this is the thing. Uh, just a second, um, looking for getting a scope or similar. I bet people with a laser engravers would make these two with the same 3D file. Ah, that is actually a quite a nice thing uh, if you have some kind of a laser cutter. Okay, honestly, if you've got a laser cutter, then you could actually open your own business selling those filters. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I would a rectang rectangle thing covering some of the light instead of a, uh, a conical section produce different effect. Yeah, uh, quite well possible. Uh, different people have been experimenting with different shapes. Okay, so this is um, quite well possible. Um, that yeah. Is your Swift scope infinity? That is the infinity version that I have right now. Okay, that's the infinity version. Um, now I lost it where I was actually reading. Okay. By the way, uh, you can sometimes get that 3D effect even with phase contrast, so it's very sensitive. Never tried that. Okay, that's interesting. So what microscope are you using? This is now called the Swift Stellar One, but uh, there are basically other microscopes that will produce the same result. Okay. So let me read this again. Okay, uh, so I'm a student also very interested in microscopy and microbiology. I also have to study so that you can give me time. Yes, have problem getting oblique on my infinity scope. Do you have this problem with infinity? This shouldn't be an issue of, with infinity optics really. Okay, um, in my view. Yeah. Um, so that is surprising that these creatures can locate higher oxygen concentrations. Yes, basically what they do is the following, just for your information. Um, because the cell has a certain size, um, they are able to detect the side of the cell that has the higher oxygen concentration because there's a concentration gradient. Okay, so for this reason they're able to move towards oxygen. Yeah, And this is actually one way of concentrating the cells, is, is you basically, you just uh, kind of, um, yeah, See, you just wait and just keep on moving further and further to the side. What I would like to do now is I would like to change, uh, it's a little bit out of focus again. Um, um, I would like to uh, change the magnification and you're gonna see it doesn't quite work always quite well with, uh, with all magnifications, okay? So this is now using the, the 40X. I have to play a little bit also with the condenser, maybe closing it a little bit. Okay, the light is already much lower as well. Maybe I'm gonna go up with it a little bit more. Okay, and uh, yeah, but here at a higher magnification, yeah, you see that it's already becoming difficult because they're moving in and out of the field of view. Um, but you still might, if you look at stationary objects, you might still see that uh, actually there is light striking, like striking the object. You look at this small grain over here. The bottom side of this one is darker than the top side. So you see that this light is still striking the objects from one side. Yeah. Yeah. Or also over here, there's some kind of a, I don't know what this is, some kind of debris and so on. You do see that it's not quite as flat. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, let us let me see, there are lots of comments. Okay, um, Fast and Furious, hello, I've just joined. 
What are you looking at, please? Well, we're looking at a water sample and I'm trying to play around a little bit with a few filters here. Um, if you joined late, uh, I would like to invite you to also then later on when the video is online to watch it from the beginning again. Um, then I'm giving you the in, uh, instructions and introduction here. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to jump ahead. Uh, in cold, the cells are also moving slower. I think I had specimens next to the window. Yes. Uh, generally, that's uh, definitely possible. When the weather is, temperature is colder, chemical reactions generally slow down. Would a, adding a small quantity of hydrogen peroxide to the slide increase the activity as protozoans due to increase in oxygen? Honestly, if you add hydrogen peroxide, chances are pretty good that you end up killing the cells. Okay, um, so uh, so the concentration must be really low. Okay, and uh, then the question is, is if it actually will form free oxygen or if it doesn't first react with the cells. So hydrogen peroxide actually is, um, is, is a poison for the cells. Okay, how do you count or estimate the amount of microbes in a sample? You need to use a counting chamber. Okay, that is one way. Uh, or you grow microorganisms on an agar plate, usually bacteria. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. How do you make permanent slides of diatoms, diatom shells? Well, um, diatom preparation is also a little bit lengthy. Um, it depends a little bit if you want to just prepare the shells or not. Um, cannot explain it so quickly right now, but you have to, in this case, also use hydrogen peroxide to remove all of the organic material. You have to use a mounting medium of the correct refractive index to see the proper stru structure of the Tom first rules. It's a little bit elaborate, uh, but it's not impossible. Um, only one disadvantage of these illuminations is that it shows the chromatic aberrations. Yes, yes, yeah, that is correct. The chromatic aberrations are actually shown, so there are some color fringes as well. How do you maintain your algae cultures? Do you buy or prepare any culture meters such as I don't do that. Uh, what I do is the following. It's pretty, how shall I say, <laughs> basic. <laughs> Um, you cannot see it because of the green screen. I simply have a jar with, with algae on here. You know what, I'm going to change to the desk view. And then you don't have the queens. It's simply a jar. It's simply a jar with uh, pond water. And every time when the water evaporates, I add a little bit more. So that's, it's, that's, that's it. Yeah? And I've been keeping this now for months. Yeah? So, um, Petri dish or a measurement slide yeah, might work. Okay, greetings from Brazil. An easy way for me to obtain oblique lighting is to put my thumb over half the light source. You know what, why not try it out? Okay, you know what, I'm gonna remove now uh, the filter. Now it's, a, it's of course too bright. Okay, so that is now without the oblique and now let's move my hand over it a little bit. Of course it becomes darker, but let's turn up the light as it becomes darker. Let's see. Yeah, you also have a slight effect. Like uh, every time I have to go up with a light intensity as well. Chromatic aberration is a little bit stronger, indeed. But again, you're able to see that there is more light coming from one side. The good thing about um, oblique illumination is, um, as well, is that sometimes it makes bacteria more visible. Uh, for example, you see this little squiggly thing here, yeah, or those lines here. Yeah, these are all bacteria, and sometimes um, if uh, yeah you don't have lighting from the side, it's not quite as as uh, they're not quite as visible. Okay. Yeah. So now let's try the following. Just for the fun of it, I would like to now try um, yeah one of these filters here. Okay. Um, this is a, a plastic sheet. Okay, and I used uh, a pen. Where do I have a pen? Look, a permanent marker to simply color it. Um, I colored it twice, I painted over it um, a second time. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And let's, uh, let's try this. Okay, um, and I'm gonna show you yeah, how the effect is here. We go back to the 10 times objective, go down a little bit with the light intensity. Let's refocus a little bit here. Okay, maybe you have to go down. Oh, and let's put this here in. The, yeah, this filter over here. And you see it's a little bit too, uh, yeah. And you have to somehow, the size, I didn't cut the proper size, so it doesn't, okay, here we go. 
Okay, and now let's see what happens. Let's center those cells again. There are quite a lot of them here now on the side. And I think that I have to go up with a little bit with light intensity, maybe go down a little bit with the... Here we go. So let's now see how this looks like when I rotate or move the filter into... And now it becomes dark because the side, the plastic side, covers now the light, okay? The filter holder itself covers the light. And it becomes bright again, okay? And now it should actually, as I move it in, start to become blue because I colored it blue, okay? And what I have now is, is I have a mix and go up with light intensity. I now have a mix of this bluish background with oblique illumination. And when I move it in all the way, and when I open the condenser all the way, then I have again um, this dark field um, effect. Okay, yeah, so what I have to do is I have to play a little bit. Yeah, and now um, the cells are a little bit overexposed because there's a little bit of a problem with the camera exposure. Go down a little bit with the light intensity and look what we're able to see. You should now also be able to see uh, a lot of uh, small moving dots in the background and these are all bacteria. Okay, it's also a nice example to see how this different cell sizes of the ciliates, yeah, and also in the bacteria in the background. Yeah, and this is also one of the possible, and it's opened up a little bit. So I have now a little bit of mix of, of this uh, blue background, which kind of gives this impression of water and also oblique lighting. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a nice uh, nice thing to experiment. By the way, here we're already at the edge of the cover glass, so you see how the, the cells, they all move to, towards the oxygen here, okay? Usually it works better if you do it uh, horizontally, either covering the bottom half or the top half, okay? Um, yeah, I suppose, yeah. I have you ever tried using a kaleidoscope lens in a microscope? I wonder what effect it would give. Never tried it, that's also interesting, okay? Saluton el Nederlando, saluton el Austrio. What was the weirdest in shape cilid you found? I have found a lot of weird shapes um, and some of them actually are, seem to have been a little bit deformed. So really they were so totally uh, out of shape that I think they must have had some kind of a damage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how long can water life survive in our homes? Well. Honestly, if you kind of keep the water sample that you have here, if you prevent it from drying out, if you always keep on adding a little bit more water and maybe occasionally a little bit of food, then I see no reason for it to be kept almost indefinitely. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, you always have to re replenish a little bit of water, make sure there is enough oxygen there. Okay. And then um, there's no reason why it should not be able to survive longer. Yeah. This is so cool, my new microscope came with blue, red and yellow discs and I want to, yeah, what they were for. Yeah, um, just make sure if the disc has uh, um, no openings on the side, okay, then everything's gonna be the same color. But if you want to make sure that the, um, the objects like you have over here are bright, like white or whatever, and the background a different color, then you must make sure that there is actually, um, yeah, only the, cent that the central part is a different color than on the outside. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, so this is a, a, a uh, yeah, thing. let's go up to 40 times, let's just have a look here, and uh, of course uh, this might not be the same, yeah, see, we don't see so much of the blue color right now, but uh, the oblique effect is still here, so let's close again the thing here a little bit, yeah. Maybe we can play a little bit, add a little bit more blue here. You get the idea. There's lots of playing around. It's already pretty blurry. You have to understand that adding a filter here also uh, decreases, of course, the resolution. Yeah, and this is also what we're seeing over here. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but you can also see that uh, all of these little moving dots here in the background these are all bacteria, prokaryotes. So, yeah, all of these here. And uh, the ciliates that are moving around here, they eat up those bacteria. Yeah? So, but I think it's, it's always probably better to, to, to use a, a slightly lower magnification here. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go again with, uh, yeah, with dark field. 
Yeah, and now the bacteria are much more visible. Yeah. The bacteria now are pretty clear. Yes. This is a, one of the characteristics of dark field uh, that uh, because it increases the contrast so much, you can see also structures or objects of, of, uh, which are much smaller. You can see them much better. However, this can also be a little bit disturbing because then you also see, I don't know, dust and dirt much better. Right? So you, you know, it's kind of the trade off a little bit, but now the bacteria are also much more visible here. Yeah. So let's move out the filter holder a little bit and see how this changes again everything. Yeah, sometimes not too much contrast is also good. And look at the following. You might have noticed when you go all the way into the center, look at the number of bacteria here that you have here. There are a few of them. And look what happens over here. A huge collection. Well, because they're also moving towards oxygen. Okay. And here we are already at the edge of the cover glass. Okay. So as a matter of fact, uh, I've made already some time-lapse videos uh, where you could actually see the bacteria move yeah, over time from one side of uh, the, uh, yeah, the co uh, cover glass to the other side. Yeah. So let's uh, have a look uh, of a couple of other uh, comments here. Amazing, with oblique illumination, you can see amoeba a lot easier. Yes, also correct. Bacteria are pretty clear. I got sick with COVID last Sunday, coughed up some mucus and put it under the microscope. Really interesting to see how many white blood cells there are in just there. Yeah. And not only white blood cells, if I've also tried this, if you uh, take also samples from your mouth or cough up things, because when you cough up, then you're also ripping along of a lot of the epithelial cells from your, from your bronchi. So you also see a lot of body cells there, which have been torn along when you're coughing. Yeah. So I was, um, I also tried this, was quite surprised to see a lot of uh, the, the epithelial cells of the lungs as well. Yeah, but you know what I'm gonna do now because I, I kind of find this a little bit interesting. Um, I'm going to move this over now to again to my uh, DIC microscope, okay? Just for the fun of it, and let's have a comparison here again. And uh, yeah, and uh, let's have a look here. Okay, this is completely um, out of focus now and completely blurry. I have to close this a, a little bit towards the condenser here. Okay, get it into focus a little bit better, a little bit brighter. Yup, here we go. And uh, let's have a look. Where where am I here? Okay, here we are at the side again. Yeah, yeah here are a couple of cells. I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I found the others. Here, a little bit more. The further I move inwards, the less cells there are. I don't know. Here on the other side, ah, here are a few more. Here on the other side of the cover glass. Yeah. Yep, uh, paramecium, finally. That's the, that's the long one over here. Yeah. And let's go up uh, to 40 times. I need to go a little bit more. I need to open up this a little bit to make it a little bit brighter. Okay. I hope you get the idea. Yeah. It's kind of uh, always a little bit fun to look at these things here. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you want to play a little bit with color, um, what I'm going to do now is, is why not? I'm just uh, just for the fun of it, because some folks are interested also in phase contrast, um, and I have one phase contrast objective on here, so I have to change the filter setting all the way, and I'm going to show you now this whole thing here using my 40 times phase contrast. Um, how does this work? I have to move this out. Okay, and uh, it's too dark. How can I make this a little bit brighter? It's a little bit too dark, but that is now phase contrast. I'm a little bit unhappy by the fact that this is so dark. I have to maybe readjust the, the camera. I'm not going to do that now. Um, but um, what you see over here now is this is really dark. What, what's going on here? Um, so let, let me just quickly check if I can manage this. Configure video. Just a second. It doesn't allow me to do that. Strangely enough. 
Okay, now I lost the camera. And here it is again. Hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit too dark here, but what phase contrast does is it changes um, it changes the um, differences in refractive index into brightness differences. And I, let me just, yeah, under my, under my microscope, everything looks fine. I somehow seem to have some kind of an exposure problem right now. But I just wanted to also show this to you that uh, in phase contrast, you're able to see brightness differences uh, changed into, um, into um, no, other way around, you see differences in refractive index changed into brightness differences, okay? Yeah. Um, surprising thing for me is that paramecium is not as common as I thought. Well, as a matter of fact, um, how shall I put this? It is fairly common. It depends a little bit. Um, it depends a little bit. By the way, that's not that's not dark field. Okay. Um, it depends a little bit on on which ones uh, uh, reproduce fastest. So I have already seen some some specimens or some some samples where there were lots of paramecia present. Okay. It depends a really a little bit on on um, yeah um, on how much they reproduce and if the conditions are favorable for their uh, reproduction. Yeah. So this is a little bit the, the thing. So I've already had some, I was lucky before and there were lots of paramecia, really only actually. Yeah? So it depends a little bit here, okay? Um, something I've noticed since uh, taking up microscopy, you start uh, paying so much more attention to details in everyday life, like the frost and the patterns on the leaves, yes. <laughs> exactly, and you start, at least I start to always question. Uh, um, I gotta tell you a story. Uh, it's actually one of my, my one of my co-workers. Um, I'm a teacher, right? And uh, when she went to university, she had a very famous uh, a protozoologist as a, as a professor. He already passed away. It was uh, in Austria, Mr. Feusner was his name. He was a really a world-renowned uh, protozoologist. And uh, my co-worker once told me that uh, I think she met him and his wife on a walk somewhere in Salzburg, in Austria. And uh, they, he and his, and his wife was also in, into studying nature and they saw a little water puddle yeah, on, on the road. Yeah? And both of them were totally fascinated uh, yeah, and they were discussing uh, all of the microorganisms that you could actually see in this little puddle of water. Yeah, he, I mean, he was a protozoologist. I mean, or, ordinary people would just pass over it and wouldn't notice that. But uh, he was actually saying, wow, he was noticing all of the interesting things that, uh, that uh, essentially uh, yeah, could be there. Right, um, so you do see nature differently this way because you look much more, um, yeah, in different way um, at at nature. Yeah, I saw lots of moving dots in my water samples. What are they? Well, lots of moving dots can be bacteria. Why not? Yeah, yeah, and dust is also quite interesting. Yeah, how do you see water bears? I tried ten times searching in moss. Ah. Water bears are um, also one of the things. I've had some moss samples where there are many of them, and then there were a couple of moss samples where they're very difficult to find. Uh, what you do is, is you take a moss sample, you add a little bit of water, and you wait a few days for the moss and for the water bears to kind of regenerate a little bit, and then you try to rinse them out, and then you have to be very patient to find them. Yeah? But they like to cling to the moss. so. The thing is, is that uh, they are not able to survive high temperatures very well. So if, uh, the, the, if dryness is okay, but if uh, the moss has experienced high temperature, um, yeah, then it's probably they're not able to survive so well. Okay, that's here now paramecium here. Yeah. Yeah, some I've been told search in lichens. Yes, it's also possible. Okay. Yeah, so that is... Uh, have you ever broken slides from hitting the lens objectives? What's the best way to avoid this? Uh, have I ever broken a slide? Uh, I think once this happened, L luckily not with my <laughs> good microscope here. Um, in, basically, in order to, uh, to prevent this from happening, uh, some microscope ob objectives have are so-called spring-loaded. So the front part of the objective, when you push it in, um, retracts. I don't know if actually this has spring-loaded objectives here or not. Okay. No, I think it's not. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it has. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take this out. Okay, I'm going to take now the objective out simply to illustrate this to you because you were, because it might be actually a, an interesting question. Look, yeah, so I've taken it out now. Look, here it is, the objective. So I'm going to show you now. 
um, because that's actually not not unimportant. The question: Look, this is uh, the objective uh, that I've uh, just removed, and um, the front part of so-called spring-loaded objectives. Look what you can do. I don't want to touch the lens itself, okay? But here on the side, when you push it in, it goes inwards, okay? And this is called it's spring-loaded. So basically, when I accidentally crash the, the slide into the objective, then it's going to be pushed in and the slide will not break and hopefully the objective will also not break. Okay? Um, so uh, this is kind of a protective mechanism. And sometimes it's like this, the lens, which is actually quite small here, um, if you look very carefully, it doesn't stick out, but it's actually a little bit deeper in. Yeah. So that means actually when you crash into the slide, then the black outside, he will make contact with the slide first. And the actual glass element that you have in there is actually more protected because it's deeper in there. Yeah, so you see that it's a kind of these are protect protective mechanisms. Yeah. So um, while it's not nice if you crash uh, the, an objective into a slide, it, it's probably also not always not that bad. Of course, if the slide now cracks and some glass fragments actually start to scratch the lens inside, then it's of course also not so good. Okay. Um, so let's go on. Um, can dark field microscopy partially replace reflected light microscopy? Um, yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. It, the system is a little bit different, okay? Um, and you can, it's not the same thing. Let, let me quickly put this back again. Um, if you use dark field, um, then, um, and reflected light, it, you can, if you, let's put it this way. If I were to, uh, let's use reflected light um, on, on my, um, where is this, uh, on here? That's the wrong camera, okay? If I were to use reflected light on here, uh, then um, essentially I would not be able to see anything, okay? Uh, because the light would actually go through the specimen because it's mostly uh, transparent. Yeah, so uh, you cannot say that it's the same thing. You are able to see certain things on the dark field that you're not able to see on the reflected light. Yeah? Do you recommend cleaning the objectives from inside using cotton swabs? Very clear answer, no. And the reason is, is because there is no reason for the objective to be dirty on the inside. So you do, and every time when you go in with a cotton swab or with whatever, then, then you're introducing dust and dirt and maybe some cotton fibers. And why would you clean it from the inside if there is no reason for it to be dirty on the inside? If some, whatever dust has fallen into it, use compressed air to remove it, okay? So, yeah, this actually is the absolute maximum details we can see, or can you also zoom in a, into a cell itself to see all of the cell de details? Okay, okay, but I'm just seeing a little bit irritated is the following, why is the image, look, um, the, the image over here is not fully filling up my, the, the screen. Just a second, look, this it's kind of shifted a little bit. I think now, now this is better, right? Okay, yeah, um, so the request was, can I uh, go up yet higher magnification is 40 times? Um, so, okay, I'm gonna go up 60 times. Okay, and uh, here we go. And then of course we have the issue that some of the cells like to move away. I'm already at maximum brightness. Um, and of course we're looking into the cells now. Theoretically, I could go up to 100 times magnification oil immersion, but that is kind of pointless because the depth of field is so low and at the same time, they will move in and out of focus very quick, quickly, okay? But if you look now into the paramecia, you can of course look into the cells. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah, oblique. And look at this, this is now how it would look like in regular bright field. And then it's actually much flatter, okay? So just that you uh, yeah, get the idea a little bit. Yeah? And then again, again with uh, oblique, not oblique, my mistake, DIC of course, okay? So um, I go through the comments again. Every Sunday I clean my slides. <laughs> I'm not doing this every Sunday, but I also wash them. I was going to ask about cleaning objectives too. Yeah, microfiber and still a box, okay. Very cool, thank you for your great explanations. Just personally, Swift Stella One Pro, very excited. Um, there has been a question, some people wanted to upgrade the Swift Stellar One Pro with uh, different objectives and had problems finding objectives. 
if you want to change the objectives for the Swift Stellar Pro, which is an infinity microscope, um, you know, the company Motec is the mother company and their objectives, uh, infinity objectives apparently fit. Okay, so the infinity objectives of uh, the company Moltec uh, and the objectives uh, for the Swift Stellar One Pro are the same. Apparently, I found a, a person who made a YouTube review video on this, it wasn't I, <laughs> and uh, this is actually quite a good thing. Uh, do you think views are best for observation microbial behavior, or is what you do you think views are best for observation of microbial behavior? What else would you you? I don't know what you mean with views. Okay, uh, make sure you get a, the trinocular, yes, chicken liver cells, chicken liver, okay, okay, never tried that. I've done, you hope we'll make some experimental films because cells move so quickly, could you freeze them? Um, uh, that's, if you freeze them, uh, there is the following danger. Um, freezing water expands and might break the cells open. Okay, so by freezing the cells, you might actually destroy them. Uh, you got to try this out. Okay, if this actually is possible. Yeah. Can you give an advice about using a micrometer eyepiece? Micrometer, micrometer eyepieces or eyepieces, I've got one here. When you look through it, um, then uh, basically you're able to see a scale. Uh, just, uh, yeah, and what you can do is, is uh, sometimes, I don't know, maybe in here, up somewhere there is the possible to, a possibility to add um, yeah to add uh, yeah the micrometer scale um, and you can remove it again and sometimes it's possible to add it here from the outside um, so it is possible to actually buy those uh, um, yeah, scales separately to insert into the eyepiece and what I have also tried to do is I tried to uh, print it on an overhead foil it made a little scale on the overhead foil, cut it out, put it in there, also it worked, okay? I think I actually made a video many years ago about this um, as well. So it is possible to also make those yourself, okay? Wow, lots of comments, okay, that's really nice, okay? Um, purchase the hope to make, I'm, I'm quickly running through the whole thing here. Uh, which is the specific use the 100 uh, times immersion all objectives, never found someone who really uses it, well, the 100 times oil immersion objective does have uses if you're looking at objects that don't move and if you need really high magnifications. For example, if you want to use it, look at chromosomes inside cells. Okay, um, and if you make chromosome preparations, for example, where you stain them, uh, then it can be actually easier to actually see them if you use uh, the high 100 times oil immersion objective. Yeah, get the 60 times for that Swift. Yes, I also recommend that. Um, for the Swift, instead of the 100 times oil immersion objective, either get a 20 times or get a 60 times. Okay? Yeah, um, so might make, uh, uh, I'm depressed with a, with a 100 times objective. The 100 oil does not magnify as much that I expect. Uh, I will tell you the following the 100 times oil immersion objective, many people are unhappy with those because the expectations are too high. You have to understand the following, that the higher you magnify, the lower the light intensity, the, the darker it becomes, but the image also will appear blurrier because the magnification increases faster than the resolution. And for this reason, you're seeing the object larger, you are seeing more detail, sure, that's the whole point, but not to the extent as you might expect. Okay, the object has to be very thin, it has to be properly prepared and for this reason I think that a hundred times oil immersion objective does not quite has, have as many applications as for example a 20 times objective or a 60 times objective. My personal opinion, um, the reason why companies still sell a lot of microscopes with a hundred times oil immersion objective is, is because this way they can sell microscopes with a larger magnification. And many people who don't know much about microscopes, they then think that this is better if they have a lot of magnification and uh, that's not always the case, okay? Um, so if you have specific applications, maybe you want to look at spores um, or you have specific um, yeah, applications, then of course a hundred times oil immersion might be useful. This thing here that you see over there, that is Vorticella. Can I not move the, can I not move the arrow? Ah, just a second, can, how do I move the arrow? Okay, here, this here, that's Vorticella, okay? It's also a ciliate, um, it doesn't have a stalk right now, for whatever reason, okay, and yeah. 
Yeah, a hundred times oil is tricky and takes practice. Yeah, I was looking at spores a week, so 60 times is really nice. Uh, some people need the hundred oil. Yes, that's correct. If you want to look at bacteria, for example, um, you, you need magnification. It's, uh, if you want to look at smaller spores, if you want to look into the cells. Yeah, but I would say for general purpose, uh, fun observation, yeah, it, it, it might not always be necessary. Yeah. So it's a trade-off. It depends really what you, what you want to use it for mostly. Yeah? Do you think it's possible to imp improvise fluorescent microscopy? Short answer, yes. Uh, obviously taking all care not to blind. What you can do, I'm not, yeah, I'm trying this um, already. You can try to use epilumination with a UV flashlight. It's known as autofluorescence. Um, certain algae uh, will start to grow red if you shine a blue light on it. Or if you use a dark field filter, like I've done now, just before, and you use a blue LED, okay? You're blocking out the main blue light, but you have the blue LED, blue light coming from the side. And then if it strikes the object, it might start to shine red. But what I heard is, is that those algae, um, you have to uh, put into darkness first for half an hour. And then when you, have, when you try that, then for a couple of minutes, you're able to get this autofluorescence. Um, however, you also need a, a camera system because sometimes this autofluorescence is so, um, how do you say, uh, weak that you might have a problem seeing it. Okay. How do you see cell organelles of onions and what magnification do we need? Uh, if you want to look at onion cell organelles, I highly advise you that you watch one of my previous videos in my other channel. I actually made two videos uh, on where you do that. Uh, you can see cell organelles in onions easily with a 40 times objective. Okay. Uh, which kind of blue light LEDs? Uh, there are different ones that are being sold. But what you can try first is there are UV flashlights and then you can try epi illumination. Okay. I've not, I've been experimenting a little bit with that, uh, but, but uh, the effect of autofluorescence in my case was quite weak. Okay. Are Motic ASC objectives different to Superior or is sold as Superconscious? I don't know about that. Um, it's a specific brand. Okay. Do you use a hot plate and what is the one that you're using? A hot plate, you mean a hot plate uh, for, for, uh, for the stage now? I'm not using any hot plates. Okay, I know that there are some um, hot plates can be used for preparing, uh, for making a, a so-called a permanent mount using glycerin gelatin. There you need a hot plate and sometimes uh, microscopes also come with uh, plates that can be pre-warmed, uh, but I'm not doing that. Yeah. Fungible glow too, some of them are more than others. Happy Christmas, yes, thank you. Okay, and uh, yeah, so here that's another ciliate over here. Moldy food is bad for humans, but I saw many cows eat moldy food and they're fine. Yep. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, many animals are able to... But you see, uh, you got to be careful. Uh, I know, for example, it's pretty dangerous if, for example, uh, cows uh, eat moldy grass. Um, some horses, moldy food is... is uh, yeah. I guess it depends on, on also on the concentration, but I've heard that uh, sometimes it can be a problem. Yeah. A uh, hot plate for heating slides, not used it, I know that they exist. Um, hot plates for heating slides either keep the mounting medium liquid, for example, uh, glycerol jelly, or uh, they can speed up the drying process, okay? Not used them if I want to make permanent uh, mounts, uh, I simply wait uh, a, a certain amount of time until all of the uh, solvent has evaporated, yeah? Inky cap glows lime green here under the black light. Yep. Okay. Uh, some, what some people have also tried is the following. You know those uh, fluorescent markers, those yellow fluorescent markers. Um, you can actually also kind of squeeze out the ink from those and use it for staining. And apparently it also fluoresces under the microscope when you add a blue light. Something I also have not tried yet. Okay. Can you explain the micro manipulation used for preparing arranged diatom slides? Very briefly. Um, there are those nice uh, slides, um, diatom slides, that are used, um, uh, that are sometimes sold from the 19th century, a uh, long time ago, historical microscope slides. And sometimes the diatom sh uh, sh shells are arranged in a very nice manner, in, in flower patterns. And people long time ago, they have arranged them um, and then made a, they made a permanent mount. But how do you move those um, diatom shells around? 
okay? Um, and what they have done is the following. They have taken eyelashes, okay? And they've connected the hair because the eyelash here or eyebrow here is actually pointed. It, it goes together to a, a, a thin point. And then they glued that hair from the eyebrows or eyelashes onto a little stick. I don't know, some kind of, a, I don't know, let's say that this is the stick and there, there's the eyelash there. And they used that to pick up the individual diatoms because it was oily, because there's a little bit of natural grease and fat on the hair. And this way they were able to pick up the diatom shells and to arrange them for, um, uh, for making uh, nicely arranged uh, diatom shells. Um, um, slides okay so at, from the micro manipulation is is actually done by hair okay um, that they actually use to move uh, move them around okay um, so this was a uh, yeah the question that's a great idea how someone who's researched about chromosomes I'm going to ask him about oil immersion objectives yep what is the most important equipment for microscopy besides a microscope oh, you'll be you'll be surprised this here is the most important tool. The reason is, is because I'm using this here also to pick up water and to transfer water. Yeah, so I would say that this is one of the most commonly used tools that I have. Um, of course, you have can use a variety of pipettes or anything, but I consider uh, this, these tweezers to be extremely important. Um, just to show you, because let's say that um, because this slide here is a little bit already starting to dry up. I just want to show this to you. If you want to add a little bit more water to the slide, all you do is the following, you yeah, you dip it in here, you pick up a little bit of water this way, and you simply place the drop here on the side, okay? And then what's gonna happen is that the capillary action will pull uh, the liquid beneath the slide, and so when it starts to dry out, you can always keep on adding more and more um, water this way. So, yeah. That's why it is even able to replace uh, a pipette, okay? So, and uh, I've been talking again over, I don't know, uh, over an hour. So just for the fun of it, I'm gonna put it back again into my other microscope, okay? And uh, yeah, and because this was a video about primarily about oblique illumination, okay? Let's go down a little bit with the intensity. Yeah, and I'm you know, using a filter here and uh, by inserting it halfway, I'm not only able to get a nice blue background, but also a slightly yeah, three-dimensional view where the top part here of the cell is bright and the bottom part is dark, which gives it a little bit of the appearance of it standing out, okay? Yeah. See again, still all of the larger cells here have accumulated mostly here on the side, okay? Okay, most important equipment, a good place to place the microscope and store it safely. Um, yeah, that's another thing. I keep my microscopes, I have a separate uh, working table for microscopy. So I keep it on the table so that I don't have to move it around so much. Um, there is, of course, a microscope cover that goes over it you know, to keep the dust uh, away. And I think that... Um, that's my personal view. If I have a, a separate work, table where I can work and, uh, and where it's easily accessible, where I don't have to uh, carry the microscope around, then I also end up doing microscopy a little bit more often because it's uh, so easily accessible. All I do is sit down, uh, look at a few, I don't know, permanent slides even just to, to relax a little bit for a few minutes, uh, take a couple of pictures and then, I don't know, for 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, and, uh, but if you have to now carry the microscope around and then unpack it every time, then you don't do that. Yeah? So um, it's easier for me to simply keep it uh, at a very accessible place. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, it's a lot of personal preference where you put it. Okay? okay, I'm slowly going to stop today, so I'm going to quickly go th through the uh, remaining comments here. Um, what was your first specimen you watched under the microscope? Uh, the first specimen that I watched under the microscope ever. My first microscope I got when I was six years old. It was a toy microscope. It came along with a couple of readily prepared samples and I don't remember what it was. Okay, But I remember that when I got my Olympus back in 1998, the first thing that I looked at were onion cells just regular onion cells because they were so easy to prepare. And it's kind of the standard <laughs> standard specimen to look at. 
Many thanks, all of you wish you a per yes, a very Merry Christmas to you as well. Can you show us your jars containing pond water? I cleaned out a few of them the other day, but essentially this one is the one that I end up using most right now. And uh, this is yeah, simply a huge jar, which is now too large to show you, containing here simply some algae. So, and, and um, this, I don't know, I, I think I've already got this standing around a year, okay? And when water evaporates, I add more water. And this one over here I collected last week um, from an aquarium, freshwater aquarium, and I simply pull out a couple of plants and algae, put it in here, um, and then uh, for growing all of those cells that you just saw, I took some of the plant material into a separate jar, added a little bit of food, uh, a crushed wheat grain. And that's basically what I've been looking at right now because this causes the cells to grow, okay? Um, what is the difference between plan and semi-plan objectives? Is the quality improvement really worth the large price difference? I'll be very honest. Um, whether the quality improvement is really worth it depends on you. Um, generally, I would say that it depends also how much photography you're doing, okay? Um, plan and semi-plan objectives, they give you a, a, a more of a sharp image all the way to the borders, edges. But if your camera setup is like this, that you're not even taking a picture all the way to the side, but that you're only taking a picture from the center, then you might not even notice a difference because the image starts to become blurry on the side. Yeah, so it depends a little bit on the on the section that you actually take a picture of. So it might not even make a difference. Maybe you just use no not plan objectives at all. But if your camera system only takes a picture of the center, then you will not see that it's blurry on the outside. Okay, so you see, um, it depends also on other factors as well. Yeah, and for some people who I would generally say that if uh, you don't know whether it's worth it or not, it's probably not worth it. Okay, um, because uh, these plan objectives do cost quite a bit more, yeah. And, and people who are into photography or yeah, things, and, and then they know that they need it. Okay, so that is my, my general recommendation. An empty closet makes a great spot for a table and a scope. Yep, I've, I know someone who's been doing this as well. Empty closet, and he made something that you kind of, kind of flip out and extend some kind of a board like a table. Okay. Bumped mine thinking of hitting the corner was it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the class. I agree. A separate and stationary working area, in my opinion, is one of the most convenient. Yes. I build a home lab just watching your videos. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> uh, that, that would be actually quite a nice thing. You know, why not? Um, send me your pictures of, of your workspace. Uh, you know, what I could do is I could, uh, seriously, uh, I'll collect pictures of where, how your microscopy setup is. Uh, send me pictures. If you allow me, I'll make a video and we'll share this a little bit. Okay. W why not? This would be kind of cool. Okay. I made space on my computer desk, uh, which was a good idea as I can hook up the camera. Yes. That's also important because sometimes uh, you want to connect uh, the camera to a computer. Sometimes it's not necessary. If you've got, a, for example, a yeah, mobile phone or so, then you can record directly, of course, into the mobile phone. But for some cameras, you do need, of course, a, a, a computer, right? Desk is a good spot. Okay. Um, are, are you live next Saturday? No, I'm not live next Saturday. On the 24th of December, I will not be live. Uh, I will be uh, celebrating Christmas Eve, uh, but then again the week afterwards. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm going to move uh, the, the, uh, uh, the live stream a little bit a day or two. Um, but I do want to keep the Christmas evening <laughs> free of a video stream. I was even thinking maybe I should do some kind of an automated live stream where I'm just showing you some water samples. <laughs> okay, um, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so where can I... Where can I send my home? That, that's actually a good idea. Uh, how are we going to do this? Um, you can send me, why don't you just send me your pictures if you want to send me pictures of your home lab, picture of, of your microscopy setup, um, send them to uh, Oliver, Oliver at microbehunter.com. Okay, it will basically end up directly with me. Oliver um, at microbehunter.com. And uh, yeah, I'll get your email. And uh, then, of course, uh, by sending me your pictures, you, of course, also uh, then uh, make sure that there are no, no faces visible of, of 
um, unless you, you don't mind being shown, because I would then like to uh, put them into the video, maybe even into a live stream, where we can then have a look at the different, uh, different setups uh, of, of the different people have. And then I'll also show you a little bit more of, uh, about my own setup, okay? So um, I'm going to slowly stop now. I've got over one hour already, but I do want to simply go through the last comments here, okay? Um, okay. Next time, if you would pick up a micro pipette for general use, would you get a one to ten microliter or? Uh, okay, no, um, for general use. Okay, I'm okay. I'm gonna answer this here as well. Just a second. I've got one here. Um, here is a a pipette, and I don't have any. Where am I? Oh gosh. Okay, that's a. Uh, this goes up to 1,000 microliters, okay? Um, the reason why I would use a larger one is the following, because you do not, you're not worried so much about small water samples and you do not need the precision. So that means you can adjust, you can also use it uh, to pick up larger volumes of water this way, okay? Um, if you, the volume is too small, then you can only pick up a smaller volume. And if you need a smaller volume, you just adjust it to a smaller volume. It doesn't have, you're not going to be uh, using this for, for fine chemicals. You know, so the actual precision is not so important. Okay. So, um, so I, I would say, yeah, it's, uh, if you get one for, I don't know, uh, I, I would say one to 10 microliters, honestly, you're not, you're barely able to see the drop. Okay, um, so I would go, uh, go for a slightly bigger one. Okay, thank you so much. I'm now very thankful to learn from you. Thank you for, for the thank you. <laughs> okay, happy Christmas, uh, paperfuge. Okay, paperfuge or CDfuge. I think I'll make the CDfuge, okay? Um, this is a centrifuge, a very easily homemade centrifuge where you're able to spin the specimens, okay? I, I didn't get around uh, making it yet, but that's actually a good idea, okay? Um, I already have a 20 to 200 microliter one. Then I think you're going to be fine, honestly. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would like to, yeah, thank you a lot. I will send you a picture of my desk. Thank you for another interesting session and enjoy the holidays. Okay, folks, I wish you all the best. Thank you for being here again. Um, I wish you uh, also Merry Christmas. Um, I will be publishing videos, of course, also on my other YouTube channel. Okay, it won't be a live stream, but I'll, uh, of course, continue to make videos also on my other YouTube channels. Um, if you have not subscribed yet to the newsletter, if you visit my, my homepage uh, or also in the link in the description, there is a place where you can sign up for a newsletter. I'll be very honest with you. I've not sent out a lot of newsletters yet, but I want to do this as well. And the newsletters will include simply a collection of links of the videos of the previous month. Okay, um, so, so I won't spam you with, uh, with all sorts of things, but maybe once a month I'm going to start sending out um, a simply a link collection where I put in all of the videos and, and live streams and so on that I made in the previous month. Okay, um, in case yeah, you're interested. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, happy, Merry Christmas uh, all over the world. Happy holidays. Um, yeah, and uh, happy micro hunting, of course, as always. And uh, See you around next time and, and, and bye bye. All the best.